Well, hey, we are continuing in our series through the book of Job with the overriding question, why do the righteous suffer? I hope you're getting a few things out of this series that, and it's causing you to grow in new ways. I know I am, and God always deals with me and grows me as I, as I prepare these messages and, and, and get them in my spirit. And so um, there's a lot to be learned throughout this book. Uh, when you got 42 chapters, there's a lot to be learned in every book of the Bible, but when you got 42 chapters of a book of one book, it's, there's, a, there's a lot there. And so uh, I would encourage you to read all 42 chapters as we go along, if you haven't already, or read it again. Um, this is our 11th week in the book and uh, with more to go. And so there is plenty of time to read the book of Job for yourself. And then sometimes we have Mother's Day and different days in there that we don't, I'm not, we're not preaching on Job. So um, whether it's your first time or it's your 42nd time, just, yeah, there's a lot to be gleaned out of here. Uh, plenty to be learned about all that happened from all the dialogue between Job and his three friends, between Job and Elihu, and, and from Job's discussion with the Lord. Just a lot to be learned. And even the conversations between God and, and uh, you know, just uh, Job and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, so, yeah, I would encourage you to read it. And something got my eye. So hopefully we can see. There we go. Two weeks ago, I started to break down all this dialogue between Job and his three friends and by going a bit deeper to see what it was that fueled the fire uh, for this long extended current conversation and why God allowed for 24 chapters of the 42 chapters to be center, centered around all this discussion. We don't see, as I said before, anything quite like it uh, throughout the other parts of the Bible. Um, I preached quite a bit on how there was a, a really uh, strong common belief uh, in that culture that the righteous do not suffer, only the unrighteous suffer, right? Um, and that's how they thought. And, and these three, three friends' minds, they really couldn't get past that train of thought and that thinking. They just couldn't get beyond that. It was like, yeah, well, wait a minute. How come he's suffering? He's righteous, but he's suffering. This, does, this, throws our, this blows up our theology. Has God ever blown up your theology? You know, you're like, wait a minute. I thought I knew something, and I thought it was this way, but then all of a sudden God, God does something. You're like, well, maybe that's not totally, you know. Uh, you know. So, but um, it's not that these guys were terrible guys. Not that they were. Uh, they could have, think about it, they could have avoided Job altogether. They could have said, oh, gosh. This guy's got boils on his body. He's got, he lost his kid. Man, this guy's like cursed. We're staying away from this guy. They could have done that after all of his tragedies, but they didn't. They at least came and they at least sat silent for seven days and seven nights to be with him, right? But when the three opened their mouths, things went south, as we sometimes say, and they kept going south farther south. They attack his integrity and his character and blame him for all of his hardships. Their, their talk was misguided, and it does not at all line up with God's grace and mercy, mercy especially now as we think about it from in 2023, uh, as we view it after God sends his son to us, right, to die on a cross, and after Jesus is obedient to go to the cro <clears throat> cross, and he's obedient to his father, and he's crucified, and he rises again for our sin. So it, it's hard to, uh, you know, imagine they're, they're, they don't have that frame of reference, so but, but from today, we see that, yes, there is mercy and there is grace at, at the cross of Jesus. Um, but I mentioned some other potential reasons as to why all this dialogue <clears throat> is part of the book. It reveals to us more about Satan and his nature, how Satan is the villain. He's the character whose evil actions are important uh, to the plot. He's also the adversary. And have you noticed he's still the adversary today? Have you noticed that? He hasn't stopped with you and he hasn't stopped with me on all that stuff. He's still coming after us, of course, because we know God and we love him and we go after him and we love his word. And so these guys in their dialogue also reveal more about who God is. I always like to learn more about who God is. Yeah, amen? In all their inaccuracies, they, they, did not, they did not spout out, they spout out some truths about God as well, though. They did, they did say that. Um, and I ended the message by pointing out some similarities between the suffering of Job and of Jesus. There's quite a number of sufferings that are similarities there. Um, Satan definitely seeped in through, the, through the, their friends and both of those, Job and Jesus, to cause even more suffering. How many of you know the enemy of your soul can even use well-meaning brothers and sisters, Christians, to cause you more pain and heartache at times? And they might even mean well, but the things you're like, eh. And uh, 
Job and Jesus' sufferings were devastating inside and out, wounded and rejected by those close to them. Uh, on the inside, and that hurts, as we talked about, you know, sticks and stones will break my bones, names will never hurt me. That's not true at all. I don't know who came up with that, but it's not true. And, um, and, and in different ways on the outside, they were their physical bodies. They were, they were uh, brutally wounded physically. Of course, we know Jesus at the cross, and, and, he, and Job had boils all over his, from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. But they were wounded physically and mentally and emotionally and spiritually. You ever felt like that? Just everything just seems to be going down? Of course, they all affect each other, don't they? They all have an effect on each other. So before we move on to Job's response and all this, I want to make a few more observations concerning Job's three friends and their behavior. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. God, we can learn from everything. We can learn from discussion. We can learn from the maps. We can learn from the, uh, the lineage of Jesus, Lord. We can learn from anything if your Holy Spirit, if your Holy Spirit reveals things to us. So Father, reveal your word to us. Speak to us today. Lord, many times it's a different thing to everybody sitting uh, under the sound of my voice here, and myself included. It's a, it's a different thing you're speaking to us. So let us open our hearts and hear what you're saying to the church, but also to us individually. And may we not be just hearers, but doers of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Tell someone he's defeated death, hell, and the grave. Hallelujah. He has defeated it all. Amen. Amen. Yes, he has. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, that takes me to my number one point today, and it's this. Job's friends had too much theology. First of all, let's look at Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar's theology. The defini definition of theology is the study of the nature of God and religious belief. Some people like to use theology as a weapon. I know you've never known anybody like that. Those who do that use their knowledge to do pretty much one of two things usually, to beat people into submission, or secondly, they brush up on their theology so that they can justify their sins by living lives that aren't pleasing to God and having scriptures memorized to back that up. Somehow they can take it out of context and back up their sin. Have you ever known anybody like that? They put this wall of protection up, so hey, I can do whatever I want because I, I can spout out more scriptures than you, and they usually can. They can usually spout out tons of scriptures. But if you have a tons of scriptures up here and none of it's here, it ain't no good. Amen. If it's all in the head and none in the heart, it ain't no good, guys, sorry. We have to remember, unlike the Lord, we are, we're never going to figure this whole Bible out. We're not going to figure the Bible out. Or we're not going to figure out God as much as we are tempted at times to try to do so and then putting him in the box and we start taking over, right? But see, God is infinite. And he's omniscient, right? We're not. hate to tell you guys that, but we're not. We don't know all things, right, as he does. And we have limits as to what we can measure and what we can calculate. He doesn't, right? He knows the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. Hallelujah. And everything in between. Amen? God has no limits. He's limitless. He's also incomprehensible. In other words, he's beyond our ability to fully understand him. He's way wiser than we are. He's way smarter than we are, right? Sometimes we're not as smart as a third grader, whatever that old show was, but God's way smarter than all of us put together, amen? Of course, he created us. See, th theology in itself is good, but uh, like anything else, it can be used in a negative way. You gotta, we all got to find that balance in everything in life, don't we? As usual, it comes down to the motives of our heart. What's the motives of our heart? What is our reason behind studying theology? It should be used with discretion. Having said that, we should all desire to be theologians to some extent. Wanting to know more about God, the nature of God, and about our religious beliefs. We should want that. We should desire to know more about God, shouldn't we? Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 2.15, to do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of truth. So we need to be able to correctly handle the word of God. Constantly, or maybe a better word would be continually, continually growing in our relationship with God. Isn't that what it's all about? Yeah, we gave our lives to the Lord a week ago or 10 years or 50 years ago, but it should be a continual growing and desire to know more of God and grow in our relationship in, with Him. See, in theology, we'll have a part in all that. But where we run into problems and theology can get us out of balance is when, when it becomes all about the head knowledge, like I said a minute ago, and none, none of it's about our heart. 
Our hearts aren't in it. It's just all about coming up here. I got all these things. I know every verse. I can quote those verses before you even start to say them, you know, and, and that's great, but is it getting in here? Is it making a difference in us? And so Paul captures the heart of the matter in the first verses of Romans chapter 8 when he states, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Knowledge puffs up. Because if all I have is knowledge, I'm getting puffed up in my own self. Look at all this stuff I know. I know everything, right? But if we, if love, but love builds up, and it builds not only us, it builds others up, of course. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. But the man who loves God is known by him. Yeah. Hallelujah. These three comforters of Job were, were learned theologians of their day. So these weren't just schmucks off the street. These were learned theologians of their day. Uh, much of their theology is right, but they still ended up being wrong. How many of you know we can be right, but still be wrong? <laughs> right? You say, what? That doesn't make sense, Pastor. Yeah. Sometimes we can say all the right things, but it's at the wrong time. Yeah. Sometimes we can say all the right things, but it's in the wrong way. It's out of a spirit of something that's not God, right? So they are speaking to Job just seven days. Think about this. After all this devastation occurs, lost the 10 children and the you know, servants. and I mean, all this stuff's happening. His physical body's being, you know, all that stuff's going on. And, and they're trying to take away the one thing that Job had left. One thing. And about the only thing he has left besides his nagging wife, and that is his integrity. Think about that. The one thing you got left besides your nagging wife, he's got his integrity, and they're trying to take that away. If you don't think Satan is ruthless, he is. This is, the, this is a great example of that, of how Satan just, uh, he'll go for broke, man. He'll just keep going at you. He'll go at us. Rarely, if he, if he ever does, a person in the middle of their suffering needs a, uh, a theological analysis, criticize, criticizing everything they say. People don't usually need that in the middle of their suffering. Nor do they rarely, if ever, need us telling them all the reasons why we're suffering. I got all the reason, and it's because it's your fault, right? That's called condemnation. I think Romans 8 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? These three guys were more concerned with their theology and winning an argument than proving and proving they were right, then, then they were comforting and ministering to Job. They were the prime example of using the, theology as a weapon. That has produced more backsliders, I think, in my opinion, in the world today than probably anything else. That one thing right there, it hurts people. It hurts people. See, the study of theology is not for the sake of boasting us up and pumping up our pride and saying, look at me, I know everything. Instead, it should be about growing in our, the knowledge of God for the sole purposes of growing in our relationship to the Lord. That's what it should be. And understanding why we believe what we believe. Right? So that brings me to number two, a second observation. And these friends, they had no humility Proper theology takes humility. We have to remember, we are not the creators. Instead, we are the creatures, the created things. When we try and study God, we need to do so with humility. These three guys acted like they knew it all. Have you ever known anyone like that? I have, me, at 16, at 16 years old. I knew it all at 16, and I could tell you everything you know, knew or didn't know or were about to know or maybe someday figure it out because you're not as smart as me. I knew it all at 16, and so I thought. Now I know different. We don't see it in ourselves when we are like that, but I assure you looking back, it wasn't pretty. <laughs> see, the thing is, when we think we know it all, everybody else sees it, but we don't see it. Pride is kind of ugly. Everybody else sees the pride, but we don't see it because we're just wrapped up in ourselves and in our pride, right? Is anybody, maybe I'm the only one. Okay, I'm the only one that's had that problem. Okay, so I, I, you guys are all humble. That's good. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. Praise the Lord. I'm preaching to the wall over there. Hallelujah. I'm preaching to myself, actually. Okay. So God's words has something to say, actually a lot about all of this. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before the fall. Proverbs 16, 18. Or how about 1 Corinthians 10, 12? So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. 
See, right? Because you can only go down. None of us has all the answers, so it makes no sense to approach people as if we do. Right? If our thoughts and words are similar to these three guys, we'll probably likely have very little impact. We're not going to comfort them and bring comfort to people. We're not going to have much impact on them. We have nothing left to say to a person in their time of need if that's all we're going to come with, is it? Really nothing to say. It'd be better to do what they did the first seven days, zip, right? Yeah. If we're going to be like that. Jesus didn't give theological lectures to people. You ever notice that? He really didn't. He just, he, he built relationships. Instead, he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, right? Being found in appearance as a man, Philippians 2, this is, and he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Think about that. Who could have boasted? Jesus. If anybody could have boasted, it would have been Jesus. Hey, yo, yo, I'm God. Get me, you know, get, well, get me water, go get me food, do me, shine my shoes, do you know, whatever, I, blah, 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 blah. He didn't do any of that. He's washing people's feet instead of asking them to shine their shoes, right? Come on now. Hallelujah. We will never minister to anyone out of pride and judgment. We won't. Proverbs 11, 2 tells us when pride comes, then comes disgrace, right? But with humility comes wisdom. Hallelujah. If these guys would have just humbled themselves before God, they could have had the wisdom to meet Job at the point of his need. Hallelujah. Number three, they had no compassion. True humility often leads to compassion. See, prideful people are usually so focused on themselves, they're thinking about so highly of themselves, they, they don't have time or energy or anything to think about other people, right? God dealt with me in this in an area of pride a number of years ago, and I've shared this story many times. I'm not going to share it here again today. And, uh, but the Lord convicted me of always having to be right, which is one area of pride, being prideful. There's a lot of areas of being prideful, trust me. But I always had to be right. Now, wives, don't tap your husbands on the shoulder and say, that's you. None of that right now. Come on now. No, no, I guess they're not doing that. Good. Then nobody laughed. Okay. So these so-called three comforters brought no comfort at all. They had a whole lot of theology with no compassion. You can't have compassion without understanding, right? Eliphaz and his two other friends don't even try to gain any real understanding about these guy, about Job, right? And where he's at in his life and try to say, hey, Job, you know, help us gain some understanding here or ask some good questions instead of just coming at him is all they did. <clears throat> Proverbs eleven twelve reveals that the fact even further, it states that a man of understanding holds his tongue. These guys were not holding back, especially their tongues, right? They were letting them rip. They were saying everything that was on their minds, and there was a lot on their minds after seven days and seven nights of silence. The problem is it was all judgment and condemnation without any grace or compassion. These guys were a perfect example. They, they epitomized Proverbs 18.2, a fool finds no pleasure in understanding. Yeah, but delights in airing his own opinion. You ever known any of those folks? They didn't take any time to find out about Job's situation. You would think after observing their friend in such a devastating spot for seven days watching this and looking at his body and all that, all that was going on, that they would be concerned for him. They're not even troubled or moved by his suffering. They have no sympathy. How could they do that after all that's happened to them? Instead, they're analyzing and dissecting every word he says. Does that sound like somebody else in the Bible? Pharisees, Sadducees, teachers of the law? Sound like them? Dissecting and looking for an angle to get in there, right? These guys have no justification for rebuking Job. Job's not renouncing God, by the way. He's just questioning him, right? The problem with these three friends is, is not only in what they say, which is bad enough, but it's also in what they did not say. That's a part of it too. As a pastor, if I'm not careful, I can allow administration, I can allow busyness, I can allow programs, I can, and speaking Christianese to others, and forget that ministry is all about gaining understanding and walking in humility and compassion so that I'm moved with that compassion. I've been guilty of doing that, the former, without the latter. So we're doing all those things, but without, wait a minute, this is about people, this is about relationship. But don't think this just applies to pastors. Don't think it just applies to pastors, it doesn't. 
applies to every Christian. We have to watch ourselves to make sure that, that we don't allow theology and doctrine and busyness and works and to overtake our understanding and compassion for others. This is even true for, for new converts. Sometimes we try to get these new converts to, converts to believe even before we let them know that they belong. Even before we let them know that they belong. Once they know they belong, it's a lot easier to bring them into to Jesus Christ. Amen, Pastor Ken. Amen. Good preaching, good preaching. Even if I have to say it myself, I'll say it myself. <laughs> Nobody else will. So I'll say, hey, hallelujah. Good preaching, Pastor Ken. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. See, you get to listen to my self-talk. <laughs> Whenever you like it or not, whether you like it or not, I'm talking to me. And if you, that's what you come to do, whether you like it or not, that's what I'm doing. I'm talking, I'm preaching to myself. So you guys can kind of listen in and go, hey, I guess I could maybe take one of those things home and, you know, apply it to myself. Or you can say, that guy is weird, whatever, I don't care. But no, you need to, you need to, <laughs> but I'm preaching to myself on a given Sunday, I'm telling you. So these three guys didn't use any discretion. In their eagerness to judge Job, they ruined any opposition, to, all opposition to, move, to, to minister to him because of the way they were. Ministry is all about caring for other people. Amen. That's what it's about. Job's buddies forgot that very basic fact. They weren't interested in understanding Job's suffering and ministering to him where he was at, right? They weren't interested in that. They just wanted to prove to him that he was in the wrong and, 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 the process, and in the process persuade him to take their advice. That's all they were really looking to do. After all, they had all knowledge in their own eyes. Job was a problem to be solved. Job was not a person to be helped. When we start thinking of people as problems to be solved and not people to be helped, we're in a bad spot. Yeah. Right? Sometimes, like I said, the best thing we can do is the first seven days, just listen. Just listen. Just listen. Never forget my mom when I was going through the divorce. My mom, back in the day when I was young, oh, she had all the answers for everything and everybody, and I was just like, oh. But then when I, she grew over the years, and when I was going through the divorce, my mom would just listen. She'd just be there for me. That spoke volumes to me. My mom had grown and realized, I don't have all, I don't have all, I'm not going to give him all the answers. I'm just going to let him work it through, and I'm going to be there for him. That helped me a lot. After all, they, they thought they were right and, and he was wrong. It was all about them and had nothing to do with Job and his struggles, of course. But see, what they failed to realize is that Job is not arguing his point to prove he's right. The poor guy is only trying to figure out what he has just experienced in his life. He's lost everything, basically. What is going on? And they're over there hammering him with some more. He's like, nice friends, nice guys. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it. Give the guy a break right? When the Lord convicted me of my pride, it was always of having to be right. The Holy Spirit spoke something to my heart that day, and I'll never forget it. It was on 131, and after I hung up with my former wife, and, and God just, I was like, okay, Lord, she said something that made me angry. I said, what about that's true? And the Lord said this, you don't have to be right. Just do right, and I'll be your defense. Amen. You don't have to be right. Just do right, and I'll be your defense. Amen. Yes, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Never forgotten that. But see, these three guys, Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar, serve, serve as a great reminder to us of what we are not to do when someone is suffering. Not this stuff, what they were doing, right? We want to have love and understanding and compassion. Amen. You know, looking back, I was not always the most compassionate and loving dad when my kids got hurt. Physically hurt, I'm talking about. I just wanted to fix the problem quickly and so that they would stop crying. That's probably why they ran to mom when they were hurt, and if she was around, but if they weren't, of course, I don't know where they ran, but interestingly enough, when we were both around, though, the kids, when they got hurt, they ran to mom. When they were afraid, they ran to dad. Nobody told them to do that. That's part of another whole message. Maybe we'll go there sometime, how God has designed men and women differently, but I just, I just thought I'd throw that out there, a little tidbit, no extra charge. But, but nobody told them to do that, but whenever they were hurt, you know, they would, they would go to uh, her. Whenever they were afraid, they would come to me. Interesting how that works. But I've shared this story before, but I, I want to emphasize a different side to this that I don't believe I've talked about. One Saturday, when my boys were young, and uh, they were throwing the miniature football around the house and on a Saturday all day long, and they were getting rough as they were doing it. And I told them, boys, somebody's going to get hurt. Take the ball outside. I kept saying, take the ball outside. Take the ball outside. Numerous times I told them, take it outside. They didn't. 
Well, Sunday rolled along. We went to church. We came home and ate brunch, what we normally do. After brunch, the boys got, grabbed the little mini football. Guess what they were doing? The same thing. Throwing the ball in the house constantly. Boys, somebody's going to get hurt. Well, I went off into the bedroom to talk to my sister because it was getting loud in there. I, I, so I went off into their bedroom. And uh, after I was there a little bit, um, I got a knock on the door. My little daughter comes in and goes, Dad, Joseph's on the floor and he's holding his head. So I went out there and, and um, I looked at his head and it was a gash and I, oh boy, we're going to the hospital. And there was blood coming. And so I, uh, in that moment, I was angry. I was angry. I, but I could have, oh, I could have said a lot of things. I wanted to lash out and tell him, that's what you deserve for not listening. That's not what he needed to hear from me at that moment. Not at all. In fact, instead, I washed his, the blood off his head, took him up by the sink. His mom was in bed or taking a nap, and I did that. And, and I just said, hey, we got to go to the hospital. And I was doing everything I could just to keep my mouth shut and try to be compassionate and loving. I was ticked off. I was very disappointed in him and them. But the grace of God, by the grace of God, I was mostly quiet. I really was pretty quiet. And I just helped him out and ministered to his physical need. The Lord shut my mouth. Thank you, Jesus. Because God used this incident for a couple of teaching moments. <clears throat> so my wife, my first wife and I, had just, we had just heard about this umbrella story. I think it, it had happened. We heard it on the radio, maybe the Focus of the Family or one of those. And So on the way home from the hospital, getting Joseph's staples, I guess it wasn't the stitches, but I told him the story and I said, Joseph, you know, when you're under God's umbrella, when you're under the, your authority, you're under God's umbrella. And when all the sleet comes and the rain comes and all these things come, you're protected because you're under God's authority. But once you get out of that umbrella, once you get out of that protection, that authority, you're exposed to all the elements. So you're exposing yourself to a lot of things that might come your way that you wouldn't have been had you stayed under authority. So listen to me, young people. There's truth in this thing, and I've seen it over and over. And so as I walked in the door, my wife shared with me how she had just told the other three children the umbrella story. And I also had the boys pay 20 bucks of the hundreds that it cost me out of their paper route money. And uh, why did I do that? To teach him another lesson. The lesson being that there is a price to pay for disobedience. There's always a price to pay. Spiritually, financially, it can, be, it can come up in a whole lot of ways, but there's a price to pay. Had I, had I raged and had I got angry with him, it would have hindered Joseph and severely probably shut him down and the opportunity to minister to him. He already knew. He already knew that he was told to take the ball outside, I won't say hundreds, but many times, okay? And he didn't. Reminding him would have uh, heaped up more condemnation and really crushed his spirit. Oh yeah, by the way, I didn't tell you what happened. David tackled Joseph into the corner of the entertainment center. That's where the split came in the head and that's where the blood came and that's where the stitches were needed. Okay, so they were playing all out football and that's all good. If you're on the grass outside, you don't get hurt so much, you know? But again, it was the grace of God to me by helping me not to say what I was feeling and instead showing some compassion, which completely changed the outcome. And God used it for good for a teaching moment for the whole family. Can you say amen to the Lord? Hallelujah. Amen. amen. So we can't minister to people out of, out of pride and judgment, as I said earlier. Mercy, compassion, and love will, will never flow from that. Lord, help us to gain understanding and hear people's heart uh, before we speak into their situation. we got to do that. It's not that we can never dialogue or lovingly confront others. Jesus did so. Look at his conversation with Nicodemus or in John chapter 3. How about the Samaritan women in the next chapter, John chapter 4? Jesus had stronger words for those who misrepresented his father and causing others to be bound like the Pharisees, like the Sadducees, like the teachers of the law, those religious folks, right? He had, he had harsh words for them. The, but there are many verses in the Old Testament that inform us that God the Father had compassion for people, and so did his Son, Jesus Christ, in the New Testament. We see that. It's interesting to note that the Bible states in the account where Jesus fed the multitudes for a, with a small amount of bread and fish, remember that? He and the disciples were in front of large crowds one time for days, and Jesus wasn't focused on, on the crowds. He, he wasn't focused on being a rock star. Okay, that's, that's my, they didn't have rock stars. That, that's my interpretation. That's the Ken King version. He wasn't trying to be a rock star, right? He wasn't trying to do that at all. He, the Bible states that in those instances, he had compassion for the people, and he healed their sick, and then he had compassion for the people because they had been with him for three days and had nothing to eat. 
what is Jesus doing? He's meeting his physical need and he's meeting a spiritual need is what he's doing, right? He's not focused on, yeah, look at me, I'm God, man. It ain't bad, I'm bad, I coo, I coo, man, I'm bad, I'm all that, and a bag of chips. You know, he ain't walking around like that. He's looking at people going, man, I have compassion for people. I love people. Hallelujah. Like his compassionate father, Jesus was moved with compassion on numerous occasions. It drove him to do what he did. And if you think about it, if you break down what Jesus spent most of his time doing while he was here on earth in his ministry, right, it was basically, it was from his heart to other people's heart in ministry. That's what he was doing. He was ministering to other people. There was no comparison coming out of his mouth. Uh, uh, you know, there was uh, these three guys. And Jesus wasn't trying to outdo people. This just came to me. He wasn't going, oh, you think that's good? Wait, you see what God's going to do in me and what's done through me? You never hear that out of Jesus, right? In fact, when the crowd started coming many times, what did he do? He went off to pray to his father, didn't he? He wasn't about, okay, I'm becoming that rock star I wanted to be. Yeah, look at me. You know that? He wasn't doing that. He was like humble before God and compassionate, moved in compassion and love. Hallelujah. All right, I must bring this to a close. And number four, it's not real long, so don't worry, the roast, weren't, the roast won't burn, burn or whatever. The fourth observation, these three guys, they had no room for God's redemption. No room for God's redemption. These three comforters saw no way that God could redeem the situation. If you transfer that thinking to the New Testament, they would have no room for Jesus. Like kind of no room in the end, right? No room for Jesus. See, if there is no suffering that is not deserved, then there can be no redemptive suffering in their minds. Eliphaz's comments leave no room for comfort or grace when he says this. He says, who has ever perished being innocent? Granted, Jesus had not come to the earth yet, but of course, this was written long before, but, but he, he was innocent and he perished. He also asks, or where were the upright ever were cut off? At Calvary, where Jesus suffered and died for the sins of the people. Of course, we know that now, years later, of course. But with their tidy little put-God-in-the-box theology, it caused them to completely miss the two most important commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That wasn't even there. See, if you break everything down the law, if you put it into those two things and you practice those two things every day, I'd rather have that person than the person that has all the theology in the world but ain't loving the Lord their God with all their heart and ain't loving their neighbor as their self. Right? Because they're not doing it. They're not obeying it. They're not doing God. They're not showing God and His love. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. i got to bring this to a close. So here we are over 2,000 years later. And Jesus died on a cross for our sins. And, and of course, He rose again as well. And uh, God the Father did not leave us without any means of redemption. He gave us his one and only son, Jesus Christ. And uh, praise God, so whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And so we can have that. All we have to do is accept that gift that he gave us, receive Jesus into our heart and life and ask him to be our Savior and our Lord. And we can know him personally. And so maybe you're watching this by video and, and you don't know exactly what I mean by that, what, what I'm talking about. You've never known the love and the compassion of God let me tell you something. When you give your life and your heart to Jesus Christ, you'll start to, his, his, he'll come inside of you and you'll know his love and his compassion and his understanding. And he'll carry you through everything that you're going through. So my, my encouragement to you today is maybe you're watching this on the couch and maybe you're discouraged and maybe you're down. I would just ask you to bow your head and just say, Lord Jesus, I need you. Come in, please. And so if that's you and you, you would you just check or uh, click on our playlist entitled More About a Relationship with Jesus Christ and it'll lead you through that process. And we want to get a book in your hand called Brand New, which will help you walk with Jesus the first 30 days of your new walk with God. Let me just tell you this. It won't be perfect, but it'll be the best 30 days. Or best, <laughs> your life will turn around and those 30 days will be great and beyond. It'll be the best decision you ever made. That's what I'm trying to say. And I know it was for me back in 1985. I know it's a long time ago, but God's been faithful ever since then. And he'll be faithful to you as well. Hallelujah. Let's give God praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and power 
and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Father, be with your people this week as they go. God, give them divine appointments. I pray, God, that we'll keep our eyes on you, Lord. We'll keep our eyes on the prize, Jesus. Lord, we'll have compassion. <clears throat> we'll have understanding. We'll desire to reach others in the, with the love of God. And Lord, just uh, protect your people on the way home. And when we come back Wednesday, may we have more testimonies, more praise reports about all the things that God has done the last three days, four days, yes. And I ask these things in Jesus' mighty name and all God's children said, amen. amen. Go in the joy of the Lord, amen.